Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I am Susan Ryan. I'm the CEO for the Center for Innovation. That is the parent organization for the Greenhouse Project and Pioneer Network. I am delighted to see everybody as you're putting your name into the chat box and telling me where you're from. It's really exciting to see familiar, uh, not faces, but certainly your names and where you're calling in from, not just from the US, but I see some of our friends from Canada as well. So welcome. Um, so please continue to put your name and the organization you're with, where you're from in that chat box. Please save your questions. You can put them in the Q&A box. There is a special box for questions and we're saving about 15 minutes at the end for those questions. So we're gonna jump right in. I'm really particularly excited to uh, share this session with you today. And I'm especially grateful for our sponsor, Perkins Eastman. So Melissa DeStout from Perkins Eastman is going to uh, do our official welcome. So welcome and thank you so much, Melissa, for the sponsorship. Thank you, Susan. Welcome to today's webinar, Innovate with Greenhouse Inside the New Trademark Waivers. I am Melissa DeStout with Perkins Eastman. We are proud to partner with the Greenhouse Project and Center for Innovation to sponsor this webinar. Perkins Eastman has a long history of working with the Greenhouse Project in developing their prototypes as well as projects. We actually did the first greenhouse in the U.S. for Presbyterian Villages of Michigan and have worked on two prototypes. Recently, we worked with Jewish Senior Life and Clark Lindsay Village. We really appreciate what the Greenhouse Project brings to long-term care, and I'm happy to be here to introduce you to today's speaker. John Ponthe is the CEO of Southern Administrative Services, who own and operate 53 greenhouse communities in Arkansas, caring for 622 elders. So I am not John Ponte, but I am going to uh, take it from here. And Melissa, thank you so much for, again, your sponsorship. And I certainly remember all the good work that we have done with Perkins Eastman. So I thought what would be helpful before John gets started, I wanted to provide a little bit of context and uh, share a little bit about what we're doing here as we talk about our trademark waiver. You know, why are we doing a trademark waiver and, and what kind of wrong with what we have already? So I'm going to share my screen right now. And just so you know, you will get a copy of today's um, session at, along with the slides. So don't feel like you have to take notes. So expansion of the Greenhouse trademark. I have been a part of the Greenhouse Project team for 15 years. And in that 15 years, everybody has known what was often described as um, prescriptive. It was very rigid and it was, you could only do this. And it was like that for a reason. We wanted to study what happens when you do this. And we really needed those quality standards of which there were 25 of them and the principles and practices of Greenhouse. We really wanted to make sure that as we did the research on the model, that we really understood what it was. But with a desire to broaden our reach as we're having conversations literally around the globe, as we're thinking about the type of climate and, and where we are right now, what happens if, what happens when? And so we've created a bit of a, 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 bit of a process to be able to help us better understand what that is. It, might we be able to find something that is a model that's all about quality, that's who we are, we don't want to dilute anything that we have done by way of quality. But what happens when we tweak it a little bit or when different things happen? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing with that intent to broaden our reach and deepen our impact. So again, I told you that we had 25 quality standards. And these were quality standards that Bill Thomas had put together and said, this is what the model is. Well, we kind of took those quality standards and we organized them into three core values, real home, meaningful life, and empowered staff. In 2021, the Center for Innovation Board, they really kind of got together and they did a review of those 25 quality standards and they organized them even more beneath those core values and they reduced them to 18 
quality standards and identified five model elements that made sense. We have to understand what it is before we can contemplate what we might do differently. So hold on, I'm going to go really fast and we're going to go through what those quality standards really are. Well, the first big model element is all about design. It's what we see. It's what we know. When you think about greenhouse, most people on this call would probably define it, oh, they're the small house people. And so the one of those core model elements are the design elements. And it's the private bedrooms with the uh, private ensuite baths. It's no more than 12 elders living in that home. It's about um, outdoor spaces, being able to get out and enjoy those outdoor spaces. I always call it, it's the open concept home where you've got food on one side, the fireplace on the other. It really creates those communal, communal spaces. In addition to that, you know, each home is separate, that it's autonomously functioning home so that you've got your own kitchen, you've got your own laundry, housekeeping, your pantry. It's all separate because that's real home. That's what we have in our homes. A home office, it's not a nurse's station, but it's a home office. We have a den space and administrative offices. You know, I don't have a business running in my own home. We have administrative offices separately. So those are some of those design elements. Another critical element is one of those core values and that's real home. So one of those quality standards really says we've got to adhere to the design elements. That part of real home is honoring the design elements that I just shared with you. Number two, it's really committing to the dining and the food preparations packet, um, the, the pr preparation practices and procedures. So it doesn't mean that I'm bringing food in from another place and serving it. It means that I'm actually preparing the food in each individual greenhouse home. And we're experiencing a level of convivium, good food with good people, the aromas of the food in the home. The elimination of institutional beliefs, practices, language, artifacts. We've got to deinstitutionalize that environment, get rid of the signage, get rid of anything that says you might be in an institution and not in a real home. Short stay rehab, as we're doing more and more short stay in greenhouse homes, we want dedicated short stay houses. A real home doesn't have half of the people coming and going and the other half there for long stay. So dedicated homes for short term rehab. We want to make sure in the next core value, meaningful life, that there is the process, that there's a practice. We have figured out if it's all about relationship, what is the process by which we deeply know who the individuals are that are living in the home? So that in number six, we can really identify the unique rhythm and the routine that each home would have. Number seven says, <laughs> It's all about control. It's all about autonomy. It's all about how an elder would be able to have some self-determination in making their decisions in a day. When am I waking up? When am I going to bed at night? What am I eating? Do I have access to the kitchen to get the snacks that would be important to me? Number eight says that it's not just a one-size-fits-all activity program, but our engagements, and we call them engagements to really engage people and living lives with meaning and purpose that are based on who that person is at the core of their being. So those, the design elements, real home, a core value, meaningful life, a core value. Here's the next empowered step, the core value that's all about the workforce. Number nine says it's about what are leaders doing to flatten the hierarchy so that we really have redesigned our organizational structure to create that level of empowerment and to really be able to think differently about what that means in the day-to-day -day practice. Number 10 says, we want to make sure we've got an empowered universal or versatile worker model. That means that universal worker model, they're doing not just the care, but they're doing the cooking, they're doing the cleaning. They're making sure the elders are engaged in a day. They're organized in a self-managed work team and there are roles that help them to coordinate and um, figure out how they're going to get their jobs and their roles accomplished. We are moving into a coaching approach. And I can tell you as a former director of nursing, it was really all about telling people what to do, when to do it, how to do it. 
the greenhouse model, quality standards, and an empowered staff core value is really utilizing the greenhouse coaching approach to better support that self-managed work team of empowered workers. Number 12 is about shared decision-making. So it's not hierarchical decision-making, but when we're solving problems, we really are looking at the different stakeholders involved and really creating an empowered workforce that's able to, we're sharing decision-making, we're solving problems together. Um, number 13 is really understanding the role of the clinical support team members as an invaluable part of that care partnership team. It's a quality standard. It's about an empowered workforce culture. And then that fifth model element is really about the model support. It's not enough just to implement everything that I just talked about, but how will that model be supported, reinforced over time so that it sustains into the future? So number 14 of the quality standard says, we are going to make sure that greenhouse education, I used to call it the secret sauce, what makes greenhouse so special, it's the education. We wanna make sure that if you're wearing the greenhouse trademark that you've embraced and you are really bringing the greenhouse education into all of those greenhouse homes. And not just at implementation, but as new folks are hired, that you're maintaining that intention to ensure that they're equipped with the appropriate education to support them in their new role. Number 15 is really, if we're growing people, those that live there, those that work there, we are really committing as organizations wearing the trademark to ongoing growth and development of those employees that are there. So that means, you know, those greenhouse refreshers and the sustainment of greenhouse education would be important uh, for model support and reinforcement of the model. 16 is that annual submission of data. Now, I will tell you, I could be called a data geek, and I think data is incredibly important. We learned through COVID that by collecting our data, we demonstrated the incredible difference that the greenhouse model had in mitigating the spread of the COVID infection and certainly um, preventing the mortality rates when you compared us with tra traditional nursing homes. So we really want to collect data on an annual basis to really say, how well are we living the core values? And what are the outcomes that we're generating to really understand, are we that quality model? And what are we doing as it pertains to the cost of care? And is this a place where consumers would want to live? Data matters. Uh, 17, we really invite our greenhouse trademarked homes into a network. It's a membership network and we really support one another. I think it's our collective wisdom. It's that thought leadership that really says it's the power of we. And so a quality standard is really inviting people into and having them commit to that level of membership. And last but not least, it's a home for life philosophy. We really want to make sure that we are inviting people um, that live with us to be there for life. No one should have to leave their home, their real home at the end of their life because they've exhausted their financial resources to pay. So we work with organizations to figure out what does that look like in your organization? So I'm going to stop sharing right now and invite my good friend, John Ponthe, to join me here. And we're going to talk a little bit about his story and his journey. And John, I think I met you my first year on the job in 2008. Um, and you, I thought it was so fascinating because you were the first for profit that was coming to the table. And I thought, well, this is going to be a story. And I was excited to meet you. And over the 15 years, I've learned so much and have such respect for your leadership. So I thought we'd start with you just talking about how did you hear about Greenhouse? And what was it about Greenhouse that you found so compelling that you had to go there? Well, th uh, thank you, Susan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so um, I'm delighted to have an opportunity just to kind of share uh, our story and, and my only uh, interest here, frankly, I'm not a public speaker and Susan knows I'd probably rather had broken glass rubbed in my eyes than to, to present. Um, but that said, um, my interest is um, 
hopefully inspiring others. Um, there's just so much out there uh, to learn. And I learned from so many other adopters and kind of feel like I've got an obligation to kind of pass that along as well. But so um, years ago, this was 2008, nine, you know, we are building very nice traditional uh, facilities that, you know, you walk in and y'all have all seen them, you know, oh my God, this is nicer than any hotel I've been in. This is fantastic. And, you know, you start looking and start thinking and turnover is still at crazy levels and the, the plagues of long-term care still exist. And you're still running a police state and you just somehow, you know, it's just not what you would hope to have. I mean, it's this, it's not the answer. And I honestly forget who uh, introduced me to greenhouse, but someone said, John, if you're going to build new facilities, you need to go look at greenhouse. We went, and I would encourage everyone on this call, you know, I'm extraordinarily visual, uh, uh, visual, but I think certainly with the greenhouse model, you got to see it to understand it really. You got to put your eyes on it. And I would encourage everyone to, to, to find one that's in proximity to you. And there's enough now that are geographically spread. And, and I think most adopters would be pleased to, to, to host you. But um, so we went and, and quite frankly, saw it and couldn't believe it and said, you know, this is, this is that place. Um, and I will tell you that, uh, you know, I, I want to do well and do good. There's no question about it. And, and this model allows you to do that, but it also requires that you do that. If you don't have that philosophy, you know, if you want to maximize revenues or maximize profitability and aren't concerned with, um, you know, or not interested in the philosophy and laying your head on the pillow at night and doing the best you can. And this might not be the model for you, but that said, um, our first, uh, greenhouse that we built, uh, we didn't know we were certainly, uh, uncertain, uh, and built a hybrid. We built, um, uh, five, 12 person greenhouse homes, and then a 40 bed, more traditional facility we call the pavilion. Uh, and then soon uh, uh, regretted not doing everything in greenhouse because everyone wanted to be in the greenhouse. And so we've since added uh, more cottages to that campus. Um, and every campus since then, we've built uh, exclusively greenhouse. Now that said, we have in, in certain areas um, had investments in traditional facilities that like many of you, you just can't walk away from. You can't, there's not enough money in the world for you to abandon the debt service that you've got. And so what we've done is we've taken the existing facility, uh, remodeled it uh, in a private room standard and then built alongside of it greenhouse cottages. And so tried to you know, build a, 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 a campus, but all the new stuff is greenhouse. And so that's kind of to give you an idea of our experience. Um, the only thing we built since we started was, was, was greenhouse and since 2009. And we've got six uh, greenhouse campuses, uh, a seventh that'll come online next month and an eighth that'll come online into this year and others that are in development. And, um, you know, very simply, um, I have a willingness and an interest in creating the right best environment of care and philosophy of care, but it is the right best economic model. Um, it, people vote with their feet and we're full. I don't know how to say it any other way. And we enjoy, um, a tremendous amount of success and I can go to bed at night knowing that no one's going to build anything down the street. That's going to trump what I got. And when you start talking about private room standard, now if you're going to compare it to semi-private type development, then, you know, there's a cost differential, but when you're talking about, you know, a private room, it 
the pricing compares um, very favorably. So I don't know, Susan, if that's enough of an explanation, but yeah, that, I'm going to I'm going to pull up your slides so we can okay. kind of um, I'm going to show a map and uh, we'll even look at a, a video in just a moment. So you can take a, a look here. Whoops, sorry. Uh, we'll get there. Let's go here to the map. And Don, I want you to just, um, you know, this is the map of Arkansas and you can kind of point out uh, the different, the blues are your communities. Anything to, to say about this map? All right, no, they're just uh, geographic despair, uh, 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 distribution. And, um, you know, if I could do greenhouse everywhere I would, and, you know, there's not enough money in the world for us to start over everywhere. But where we do rebuild and where we have uh, upgraded, we've done it uh, in the greenhouse model. And so the hybrids that you were talking about, which you've listed down uh, below in some of those bullets, those are the ones where you've got traditional as well as some greenhouse homes. Is that correct? That's that's correct. Um, okay. And um, and I would say as well, this map represents a a great mixture of uh, rural and urban. Um, it's in the largest uh, cities in Arkansas, and it's in, you know, uh, rise in Arkansas doesn't have a, I mean, doesn't have a stop sign, much less, I mean, a, 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 a red light, much less, you know, very few stop signs. And so um, I think it's a community of 800 people. And uh, I bet we've got more elders uh, per capita in that county that are living in a nursing home and we can't build enough greenhouses and I, I would dare say it might be the only rural nursing home in the United States that during COVID was adding cottages because we had still had a waiting list. Um, so, um, you know, it's this is a this is a mixture of, of, of rural and urban. Yeah, I think, you know, as we think about um, rural areas, and it's a real problem. I mean, nursing homes are closing and that sort of thing. Let me just ask a real quick question. How are you able to get staff in some of those rural areas? Is that a problem for you? Oh, you know, everyone's got their challenges and we could sit here and complain about that all day long or, or get busy, you know, fixing that problem kind of thing. And so, um, you know, quite frankly, um, we don't have the turnover um, in greenhouse that we have in our traditional homes. And so I, I, I would tell you quickly, um, proud uh, operator of uh, 34 uh, skilled nursing facilities. Um, and so I would tell you, this is not a dish on by any stretch of the imagination a traditional facility. I uh, very, very extraordinarily proud of the work that's done and the angels and the magnificent caregivers that, that do that work every day. That said, if I'm gonna rebuild, this is what I think represents the future of healthcare and what the public wants and what I think works best. So, so that's kind of, um, Kind of where we are from a from a from a competitive point of view, but but from a staffing point of view, um, you know, staff is no different. They want to work amongst the best. They want to have they have a sense of pride and purpose. And um, I think once you go to work in a greenhouse, you don't want to work in a traditional facility. I've heard that. I've heard that said once. I've heard it said a thousand times. Well, we've done interviews with some of your, your staff and I'll, I'll never forget one of your care partners. Uh, she said, I get so excited to think that I'm a part of something that's so much bigger too. I'm a part of innovation. I'm a part of really making the world a better place. And I mean, she, she in little Mina, Arkansas, she felt that connection to something bigger. And it's that sense of purpose that I think, you know, this empowered workforce model is really trying to do and to creating those relationships that I, I tried to describe earlier. I'm going to take you to your occupancy. Um, you've talked a, a bit about it. You've got some national averages. So that's pretty, uh, pretty 
incredible uh, what you've got here. So talk a little bit about your waiting list and the consumer <laughs> demand well, that you have. Again, I mean, you know, these would all be at 100%, but for, you know, the mix of Medicare versus private and the preferences of, you know, some people that want to be in a cottage and want to wait for this, that, or the other. So, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's certainly a great demand and, um, you know, in all of these properties, we've got waiting lists and some that, you know, I walked into one of these facilities not too long ago and I said, well, how long is your waiting list? I said, 200 people long. I said, well, come on. Uh, I don't believe, you know, and so I don't know that it's been updated as, as, um, and I don't know how many of those folks are moving ready, but let's just say it's, it's, it's robust. Well, so you're describing, obviously, there's, there's quality um, associated with everything you've said. Consumer demand, we've talked about uh, that already. So that you, you're creating something that is really accomplishing that. I'm going to uh, now show the video of Poplar Grove. This is what John would characterize as one of his urban communities. And John, you've got 10 greenhouse homes there, 12 elders in each home. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at the video and then we'll come back. Take us. So, Ariel, John, um, just kind of really quickly go through some of these slides. You can see the bedrooms, bathrooms, the hearth area. I've spent many a time there. We did some filming there in uh, 2019 and really, really enjoyed it. Um, so, there you go. I'm going to stop sharing now. And, John, okay. let's, let's transition. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, who wouldn't? want to live there. So your waiting list doesn't surprise me. So why make a change? You obviously have achieved some incredible success. So talk a little bit about the process, you know, why you have decided that you're going to try something different. Well, I, I, uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, when you stop innovating, um, that's, that's problematic. And, um, you always learn uh, every greenhouse that we've built. And this is the, quite frankly, the value of the greenhouse network um, is you, you learn uh, you and, 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 you know, every uh, project that we do is still, you know, certified. Do I quote, and I've, Susan, I've said this to you, do I quote need greenhouse? Do I have, people that have the capacity now of doing the level of intensive education and training and development. I've got those internal resources now, um, but I choose to associate with Greenhouse because they continue to bring value and expertise and support um, new developments and the initiation of those new developments. And so um, in that vein, um, you know, we've learned a lot. And, you know, as we, as we look at greenhouse, um, we sat down uh, within our organization recently and said, what can we do different, better? I mean, there's nothing perfect. And quite frankly, if someone were to ask me, what's the best and worst thing about a greenhouse? I would say it's the same thing. And that is, it's, it's, it's magnificent because it 
it, it's a small intentional community of 12 elders living the purpose uh, in, in, in their own home. Uh, but it's just 12, you know, I mean, and so if you're looking to have a, a recital by some concert pianist who's coming to town, you know, unless you've got a rehab gym or something else where that's got communal space. I mean, th there, there's always a trade-off. Um, if I'm going to trade something off, that's it. Um, but, you know, you start looking at other um, uh, elements of it. And, um, you know, quite frankly, the truth is when you're working uh, in this type of model, two cottages work together there there is a, a symbiotic relationship between cottages and when you're talking about staffing and one cottage you know you've got a four on two off schedule you know is, is optimal and then a four on two off at the sister cottage and then you've got one team that works back and forth on the two days off here and the two days off there and so really you have three you know, care teams that coordinate the care for two cottages. Um, I mean, that's how how functionally it works. And so, so we start thinking about that, you know, um, and then we start thinking about, okay, what are our challenges? Everyone on this call, everyone who's in this industry um, wants to um, have the most efficiency they can get in economies of scale without sacrificing, in, in my case, the intent and the integrity of the philosophy of care. Can we do things that reduce you know, operating costs and create a, a higher degree of staff satisfaction and building costs without sacrificing any of the core components of this model? And we felt like we can. And so, you know, what you're going to introduce here is a new model that we've come up with that we, we're, we're going to try and, and, and we're going to uh, um, compare it and contrast it and all its metrics and all its numbers to our other um, more traditional greenhouses. And, um, you know, ultimately, we want the best dietary experience we could possibly have. And so we feel like um, perhaps uh combining uh, uh, kitchen capacity, you know, set up 10 kitchens in the Texarkana uh, project, we've got five. Instead of, you know, 10 laundry rooms, we got five. Instead of 10 electrical boxes, generators, sprinkler systems, you know, um, you know, you less exterior walls, the nursing has less ER boxes. I mean, it just, it just kind of offers something in that regard. And then, you know, when you look at it from a staff satisfaction point of view, we're all competing now and trying to do everything we can to make the work environment, um, you, know, you know, have a quality of work life. And so when you look at it, you know, um, here's the downside, you know, um, there is more isolation in greenhouse than there is in a traditional facility, clearly, you know. Um, and so, and so this kind of reduces that isolation effect, which has more appeal from a, from a staff point of view. Um, you got a better ability to cover emergency situations between cottages. And I think ultimately as well for your staff, if you can limit their exposure to elements, you know, going outside and having to traverse, you know, the elements when you're moving about cottages, that's an advantage as well. Um, so you, you kind of mixed all that together and we said, you know, let's try something different. And then I guess that's what you're going to show now. Yeah, let me get the floor plan pulled up. And, you know, John, you I heard you say um, there, there will be something about efficiencies that, let me go to the next slide. Um, that you talked about and, um, you know, that staff camaraderie. So just so everybody knows, this is the floor plan and you will get these slides as I uh, remarked earlier. This is a 12 person cottage. So just so you orient yourself to what John has done <laughs> yeah, 53 times so far. 
And now I want John to unpack what he's doing here. So talk a little bit about what we see here, John. So you can make it as complicated um, as you want, but it's very, actually very simple uh, and very elementary. Um, we just took that same box you just saw and moved them together and then moved, you know, and positioned uh, two cottages and or two of these double cottages in proximity to each other. And so, so we just took the kitchen and we just merged them at the kitchen, quite frankly. That's the kitchen right there. I'm trying to get my cursor kind right. of going over it. Yeah, that's, okay. That's all we did. And so our intent is to have a more uh, robust uh, dietary experience and create and, and to hire um, uh, someone within, you know, each of these, uh, double cottages, uh, who can enhance the culinary experience, quite frankly. So, um, and then, and then to, to kind of do it in such a way that, um, that, that optimizes your, some of your, um, uh, building costs and some of your operating costs. And so, um, this is just a picture of the campus. You've got basically it's 10 cottages um, in sets of two. Uh, on the far left there, you have just, uh, it's, it's basically four 12 person cottages, but they're, they're, they're grouped a little differently. And, um, but again, what we determined was, um, we think we can have our cake and eat it too. We think we can, maintain the intent and the integrity of the model and the philosophy of care and and operate what's it, what's important is operate 10 12 person greenhouses so so each greenhouse is 12 elders and that is the that is the limit and 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 the experience that they're going to have is exactly the same as the experience in any of our other campuses in a 12 person greenhouse. Um, and it just, you know, we've, we've, we've combined things a little bit and, and, and kind of tightened it up a little bit. So talk about, so since you put uh, two homes sharing one kitchen and we feel pretty strongly about our, our kitchen and, you know, certainly decentralizing it, really making sure that elders have access to the food, the nutrition and that sort of thing. Convivium is important. So talk about how in this new paradigm, you're planning to really meet that intent of that quality standard that we hold so near and dear. The same practices exist in this particular structure that, that exist now in our 53 other greenhouse cottages. Um, uh, and so the same access to the kitchen, the same aromas from the kitchen, the same, and we're just going to have a more qualified um, dietary group, which still is going to be certified Shabazine, um, but perhaps we can pay them more. Uh, perhaps we can find someone who's got, um, uh, who is, has better and more robust culinary skills um, and create a more you know, uh, bountiful dietary experience. I don't know how to, how to characterize that, but, um, we can do better there. And, and that's the intent of the, if, if in the end, there's, there's certainly some savings on equipment and space and cost. It's not going to make or break the project. Quite frankly, there's some economies of scale. It's not going to make or break the project. I mean, right now, you know, quite frankly, um, you know, this, this doesn't offer, I mean, it's not, a, 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 like I said, a make or break element of cost or operational efficiency. It just, we think ultimately we can achieve essentially everything we're achieving now in a 12 person cottage uh, and do it with a little bit more staff satisfaction, a little bit more uh, support and a little bit less cost. Well, I, I think, you know, those are certainly factors worthy of consideration. And I think, as I, I said earlier, it's important to me that we, we look at this through the lens of an innovation study. And you said, if we don't innovate, you know, 
we're going to die on the vine potentially. I mean, that's what some will say if you don't continually innovate. But given kind of where we are with trends and the landscape um, construction costs, so I appreciate everything that you're you're saying there and the customer experience and really wanting to improve the uh, food experience that you talked about. Um, so what I'd like to do now, because I have seen many questions kind of coming in, I'm going to pull up some of the questions uh, that you could answer. Let's see. Um, all right, let me see. Let's see if I design these. And I want to make sure people are putting your questions into the um, into the question and answer. In the established campuses that are hybrid, how have you changed the established environment through greenhouse philosophy? So I'm assuming that uh, the question is really asking about what have you done in the traditional homes where you've got both traditional and greenhouse homes? What are you doing um, yeah. to address the traditional environment? So uh, first things first, um, we, we've, we've gone in and I shared this, we renovated the existing facility uh, to an all private room standard. Um, kind of got to do that because Otherwise, everyone's going to want to go in the greenhouse and you're, you know, it's, this is how it is. Um, and so, and then we've, we've um, prioritized operationalizing the greenhouse in the greenhouse standard. And then we're using that same philosophy of care and bleeding it over and creating that same type of, of, of operating environment and same type of culture in the traditional uh, home. And, you know, there's nothing to say that you can't create neighborhoods in a traditional facility and accomplish, quite frankly, a, a, a great percentage. I mean, it's, it, so what I would say, Susan, about the Texarkana, what we're doing in Texarkana and that, that new model or what we've done elsewhere, it's all garbage architectural garbage if you don't execute on the in the the right philosophy of care and build the right culture I mean, otherwise you're just spending money for nothing you might as well have gone and done a traditional facility and done it and saved yourself a little money because if you you know take that shortcut and don't and don't fully and finally uh, meet the intent and the integrity of, of, of that culture, you wasted your money and so um so so we are we are uh intent on on taking those same standards and the same philosophy of care from greenhouse to the traditional facility and we can accomplish almost essentially what we do and it's a little different here and there but but it's very similar so do you have couples that are a part of your greenhouse communities Yes, um, but quite frankly, uh, most couples that come in, they when they interview, they say, "I want to be in the Scott House, and so and I want my wife to be down in the uh, White House." Um, <laughs> uh, I say that, but um, uh, no, we we the, the the and that's another element of the of the program that we've changed in the last five years. Every one of our new developments now uh has bigger rooms on the ends and for couples quite frankly because it's just something that we didn't necessarily provide for early on in our development and now we're building bigger rooms so that we can accommodate couples better awesome so i realized that there was a slide i was going to put in about your payer mix um your beds are all duly certified, Medicaid, yeah. Medicare. And um, I kind of did some averages. Your average for Medicaid, it looked like it was hovering close to between 60 and 70%. Is that correct? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, that, and so I, I, we operate in Arkansas. Um, we operate in, you know, a, a CON state. And I don't get to pick and choose. I, I have to have the beds in the markets that I develop, and um, I'm subject to the payer mix that's 
in that marketplace. And, um, you know, some of them don't have a critical mass of Medicare. Um, some of them don't have a critical mass of, of wealth that would support um, a big private pay market. So, so a great, I mean, a significant majority of our business is Medicaid. Do you want to talk a little bit about your Medicaid rate and a bit about what was done? Arkansas is one of the few states that did have a slight bump in their Medicaid yeah, reimbursement. Yeah, we uh, historically our rates have been two twenty something like that. You know, bed tax was about thirteen, fourteen, fifteen dollars. Uh, high, high um, liability cost per bed, which is probably I don't know. 15, $20 a day. So you start factoring those things, you know, factor out the bed tax, factor out the extraordinary liability costs that, that we, we as a state enjoy um, or don't enjoy, so to speak. Um, you know, equivalency rate in the 200s, 2, 210. Um, uh, most recently, we, we've gotten some, some, um, relief and um and the state is is going to move toward uh valuing pri uh, private rooms higher and giving a differential level of compensation for private rooms and i think cms is thrilled to do that and i think we're all gonna quite frankly whether we want to or not um are going to be in a private room standard in the next five years. I would totally agree with you. So talk a little bit about Department of Health surveys. What are your surveys like in a greenhouse home? And do they inspect each of those homes? Absolutely. And, yeah, absolutely. And and I can and tell you- How many you administrators, know, talk about the staffing, administrators and defense are needed. Um, in terms of administrators, uh, an administrator and DON per site. Uh, yeah, well, it's the same. It's a it's it's the same scope that we would have in a traditional facility. It's no more or less. Um, you know, it's it's more um, intensive on Shabazin. Uh, we've got more direct caregivers just because that's the nature of this model. Um, but our administrative staff and leadership staff are essentially kind of the same as what we would find in a more traditional setting. So when you're getting ready to open a community, um, when do you start recruiting staff or are most of your um, your builds from your traditional homes, you're building on that same site and is it the same staff coming over or do you ever build the new greenfield where you're having to recruit? And if so, Absolutely. what's the timeline to? Absolutely, you want to you want to do something tough. You you start uh, a brand new campus with no uh, uh, staff, no elders, no systems, and a brand new market, and you build a greenhouse. Um, we've done that, and um, you know, quite frankly, your biggest concern is catastrophic success. Um, you know, you have to grow carefully. Um, you could probably fill it up in three months. Um, just cause you can, doesn't mean you should, right? Um, gotta get the culture right. You gotta get the systems right. You gotta, um, uh, grow the campus smartly. Um, and so we've done both, Susan, to answer your question. All right. And, um, a question about dementia. Do you uh, segregate so you have a dementia only house and is there a different design exterior and interior if you do? Uh, no difference in the design. Um, we'll have um, a security system that kind of reflects the uh, wandering nature of dementia patients uh, in a dementia cottage. What we do is we um, create uh, defined uh, greenhouses for dementia. Uh, we found that that's better in terms of just our training and our ability to support those elders. There's many in the industry and certainly within greenhouse that say, no, you mainstream them and you don't define somebody by their diagnosis and blah, blah, blah. And that's fine. And they're not wrong. But that said, 
about, you know, do you change one for the other? I've had someone once say that, um, who served on the Alzheimer's Association board, that that uh, greenhouse was the best non-pharmacological treatment for Alzheimer's. And I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, think about every trigger associated with dementia and Alzheimer's and, and greenhouse is the antidote uh, almost in every circumstance. Uh, and it's just an amazing model for folks that um, uh, live with that affliction. I, yeah, I think we've had incredible success with that. And, and I couldn't agree with you more um, in terms of the best non-pharmacological intervention. So talk a little bit about the cost to build your homes and those that you have built and how do you anticipate it shifting uh, with the project in Texarkana? And of course, it's not apples to apples given the time. And then I'd like you to talk about financing uh, your greenhouse homes. Yeah, so um, so our costs have been uh, moderated. Um, and what I would what I would offer to uh, folks listening in is that um, you know that you build it is 10 times more important than, than having every nook and cranny, right? I've been to some greenhouses, quite frankly, I walked in and there is a level, I mean, you saw the pictures, we've got an amazing decor and environment of care, but I've been to places that has the most ornate woodwork and elaborate this, that, and the other, and so broken up and, and they've spent, you know, Four hundred dollars a foot, and it's just almost you know we're way less than half of that um, per foot. I mean we're probably one hundred and ten to one hundred and thirty dollars a foot, depending on what market we're building in and 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 so forth. But um, and we're just we just got underway in Texarkana, uh, and so um, we did the surveys and looked at it. Yeah, it's a little bit more expensive than it was before you know, COVID, but it's still, you know, certainly doable or we wouldn't be doing it. And we've done it all through traditional financing, you know, 20 year AM uh, and commercial rates, and commercial banks and, and uh, um, you know, so it's, it's, there's, there's, uh, you know, banks, you know, you know, we don't, I don't have, I met with a banker this morning. They, there's no issues. I mean, they happy to loan all day long and twice on Sunday on this project because there is, you know, a track record and, uh, you know, a proven record of success and financial success. And, and, you know, of course, you know, kind of the model speaks for itself. So talk about the amount of land needed and talk about it in context. So you've got the single family home that you've done in most places. And now you've got the, the two that will come together. Are you in the, the scope of that project? Are you saving land by, you know, combining, yeah. I'm assuming to some degree? Yes. Yeah. So, so let me say in terms of, in terms of the design, I mean, you're building a cottage, you're designing a cottage, you're just replicating that cottage on a campus a number of times over. You don't have to overcomplicate that. Um, and you know, so in terms of land, it depends. I mean, you know, we've got, you know, colleagues out there, Susan, that have built in Boston and and other major metropolitan areas. And, um, you know, you, you adapt to what you have and your circumstances and conditions there. In Arkansas, where land is plentiful, one of the values of greenhouses, you don't have to go buy the most expensive plot of land in the perfect location go find a park-like setting off the beaten path people will come find you uh and and that's one of the economies that you can have because you will be successful you will attract a business and you don't have to do it in the most visible commercial piece of property that's most expensive and so generally speaking if you said to me i give you uh, an acre per cottage now we've got these double cottages, so probably same suits there. I would say that's perfect. Uh, and only because sometimes you can buy a piece of land for 
a million dollars, by the time you finish with dirt work, you're into it for two and a half. So every piece of land is not made the same. I mean, you want to find something that, you know, it doesn't require a tremendous amount of, of dirt work and site work to get it, you know, in a position where you can build. So um, those are all, you know, relative things, but um, an acre, now you can do it on far less than that. Um, you know, Bentonville is six, uh, uh, six cottages on maybe three acres, two and a half, two and three quarters. I mean, it's, it's pretty tight. Um, but it's magnificent. I mean, it's got a great uh, community setting and great, uh, uh, you know, home-like environment. So it's all relative. Uh, yeah, I'm for sure it is. A um, couple more questions. Um, do you have residents keep pets? Yes. Yeah, now, I, now, now, everything comes with a but. You know, I mean, you know. The other elders have to, I mean, it's got to be something that the other elders tolerate. And, you know, what we quite frankly found is, you know, um, if, if it works for everyone, great. But a lot of our staff will bring their pets with them when they come to a day and it becomes the, the house's pet. And when that staff member leaves, that pet leaves with them and all the associated responsibility. And so, um, you know, th that has been actually something that's uniquely uh, interesting. But, um, but yes, we do have uh, uh, elders that have pets and it's not been a problem. Yeah, I, I remember when I was there in um, Belmead and Paragould, we filmed the interaction with elders and the um, pet, the dog that was in the, the cottage, it was wonderful. Um, so how large is your cottage? 7,500 square feet. 7,500 for 12 people. 12 people, yeah. And do you do feasibility studies? I think I know this for your proposed projects. I'll let you answer for me. <laughs> no. Never. No, I haven't you... done the first. Uh, so, so um, you know, you can't make this work. I mean, now, if you, now I'm going to tell you, it's hard. It's not easy. But if you operationalize it right and you create the right, um, um, service quality, clinical quality. Um, you, you, I mean, I, you're going to beat everybody else. I mean, you know, people are going to want to come here. Uh, it's, 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 that's, uh, that's, that's not up for discussion. I mean, that's, that's asked and answered. Um, so, um, but uh, we've never done a feasibility study. Um, so, well, we, uh, John, this has been fascinating and I always learn something new and we are delighted um, to really embark on this, what I'm calling an expansion of the trademark and an innovation study. And I can't think of a better partner to be on that journey with than you because you certainly know you have done the tried and true. We know what works. You've generated incredible benefits from the homes that are open. And I think... I'm sure that everyone that has listened today has heard the commitment, that equal commitment and dedication to ensuring that, you know, that philosophy must be maintained. And this will be an iteration that we will study and uh, we will continual, continually innovate and you know, with our desire to broaden our reach and to deepen our impact. So John, thank you so much for joining us today. And Pleasure. we're gonna take those questions that weren't all answered. We will kind of, try to prepare some FAQs and kind of get them out to you um, at a later date, but really appreciate everybody attending. And Janet, I'm gonna ask you that you bring up our promotional slides um, to let everybody know we have another webinar for you. That's really, once again, building on that idea of cultural transformation and really thinking about quality models. Uh, we're gonna talk to uh, Marla DeVries, our chief learning officer will be talking to Carol Silver Elliott and how she's taken Greenhouse core values into the traditional environment of Jewish home family. Aaron Kolb is the CEO at Poitras Home and they will be opening three greenhouse homes that are what we know greenhouse trademark to be, but she's uh, doing a little bit um, in that they had three homes that aren't quite trademarked. 
she will be engaged in the trademark waiver, but she's really wanted to make sure the cultures align. And so it's this is all things cultural transformation. On the next slide, I want to make sure all of our listeners know about our conference. Please save the date and we will have registration launching probably within the next week or two. But July 23 to 26 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Pioneer and Greenhouse Project Center for Innovation's first conference with their alliance in Pittsburgh, and our theme is Ready to Impact. Um, next slide. Um, it is 20 years of greenhouse, and we are we're throwing a party all year long. Uh, so stay tuned. Look for some of the um, 20 for 20 uh, little promos that we're doing and celebrate with us along the way. Uh, next slide. If you haven't listened, I would invite you to listen to Elevate Elder Care. It's the Greenhouse Projects podcast. And um, I talked to some amazing people, as well as my colleague Penny Cook is talking to uh, several people as well. So I hope that you'll listen in wherever you find podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or you can find them on our website. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And John Ponty, thank you so much for the work that you do. We are, are grateful for your dedication and commitment to Greenhouse. And Melissa DeStout with Perkins Eastman, we are grateful for your sponsorship and for the work that we've been able to do together over the years. Thank you to our listeners, and thank you for being a part of our webinar today. And wish you all the best for the rest of your afternoon and the rest of your week. Take care. <laughs>